All right, I got the uh, recorder started. Um, and last week, you know, I you know, I think on Wednesday, I recorded on the wrong channel, on the video part. So the audio is was there, but not so much the video. Um, you know, that's kind of it's a throwback to when it's in the time when I only got audio recording for my classes and not the video. That was like twenty years ago. <clears throat> Anyway, we're going to get started today, um, and we, it has been another week already. <laughs> Are there any questions about the material that we talked about last Wednesday? I certainly hope that you guys got some time to review the material and also read ahead a little bit, because I believe, based on you know listening to my own recording from last Wednesday, the last topic that we went over was binary addition. We didn't quite get to binary subtraction. Is that correct? Okay, all right. So I'm not going to spend some time to review the binary addition topic, you know, just because we lost the day already. So if, we, if I were to go back and review some of the material, we're going to lose more time. So I'm going to start with bi um, decimal subtraction first. So the, de the decimal subtraction example, oh, okay, let me move it a little bit here, is right here. So we are trying to compute what is the difference between 501 and 504, and we are trying to do it all in base 10. So the first question is, what is 1 minus 4, which is your digit 0? Most people would say negative 3. But negative 3, or the whole concept of a negative number, is actually kind of difficult. Okay, you know, That's not something that you learned in elementary school, or at least not early on. So the other way to look at 1 minus 4 is what do you get when you subtract 4 from 1? Okay, that sounds like the same question. But, you know, in the land of multi-digit subtraction, you can say, well, since 1 is less than 4, I cannot do that subtraction. You simply, you know, throw your hands up and go like, I cannot do it. But, wait, I can do it. Because I can borrow a 10 from the next digit, then I have 10. 10 plus 1, because the 1 is what I already have, is 11. 11 minus 4 is a 7. So that's why I call the single digit difference between 1 and 4 when you subtract 4 from 1 is 7. It is similar to the concept of a single digit sum, except in this case it's called a single digit difference in subtraction. So once I understand that concept, I also need the concept of a borrow. So that means you know, when I look at 1 minus 4, I tell myself I need to borrow 1 from the next digit, from the digit from digit 1. Um, comparing digit 0 to digit 1, the quantity represented by digit 1 is 10 times the quantity represented by digit 0. So when I borrow, quote unquote, a 1 from digit 1, I'm actually borrowing 10. So that means you know, now I have 11 minus 4, but I also have to remember that you know, I, you know, I thought I borrowed from digit 1. So I'll be okay with this representation because I think this is not usually how people write binary subtraction in a multi-digit way, but it is the way that I do it because I need to spell out every single row so that I can I have a name for every single digit on the screen. Then I can generalize the approach and say, okay, now I can build a circuit to do this. I'll be good with all that stuff so far. Okay, all right. So just to make sure that we understand it, I'm going to put this on the whiteboard because it's just going to be something really quick. Uh, what is 4 minus 7? What is the single digit difference between 4 and 7? 7. And it needs a borrow of 0 or 1? Borrow of 1. Very good. Uh, what about 9 minus 2? What is the single digit difference between of 9 minus 2? Seven with a borrow of zero. zero. Very good. So instead of saying there's no borrow, we say there's a borrow of zero. So this way, you know, later on, we can generalize you know, this entire approach so that we can compute the borrow bit as well as you know, perform the calculation on the single digit difference. All right. Um, so when you look at the calculation that's on the whiteboard right now, after the entire subtraction, we have 997. This is because the difference has to have the same number of digits as the subtrahend 
as well as, well as the minuet. So the question is, which point, which one is the minuet and which one is the subtrahend? X is the minuet and Y is the subtrahend. Those terms are particularly important because subtraction is not commutative, unlike addition. Addition is commutative, which means what? What is the, what is the term commutative referring to? Exactly, you can switch the side of the number being added and they will still give you the same sum. But that is not true for subtraction and that's why it is important to understand the terms for you know, what, if, what quantity is being subtracted from and what quantity am I subtracting from the first quantity. The first quantity, once again, is called the minuend and the second quantity is called the subtrahend. All right. So now that we have talked about the general idea of subtraction, oh, I still have to explain why 997 does make sense because we have a borrow from digit three. Digit three is responsible to specify the quantities of 10 to the power of three, which is a thousand. So that means we end up with a quantity of positive 997, but we owe 1000. So do you think that that's basically the same thing as negative three. Imagine you have $997 in your pocket, which I would never have, but you owe the bank $1,000. So when the credit card company tried to assess your net worth, what is it? Negative three. Negative three, very good. So that's the whole concept of the overall borrow, because this bit, the one that is highlighted right now, says I owe 1000 so that means that the actual quantity I'm representing is 900, 997 owing 1,000. Is that okay? All right, so we're gonna move on to talk about the R and the B function. The R function is the single digit uh, difference and the B function is the borrow function. So the way they are defined is the R function is defined down here and then the B function is also defined down here. So let's just kind of focus on this one here. R of UV, which means what is the single digit difference when we subtract V from U, is 10 plus U. The 10 plus makes sure that the sum between 10 and U has to be greater than the largest digit in base 10. Does that make sense to you? What is the largest di digit in base 10? nine, uh, and what is the smallest digit in base 10? In whatever base? Zero, that's right. So that means your U can, be, can only be as small as zero. 10 plus zero is already a 10. So no matter how big V is, because V is also a single digit, it can only go from zero to nine. It can only be up to nine. So that means you know, I have handled all the extreme cases already. But there's also a mark 10 after this, because what if u is greater than or equal to v to begin with? Then you're gonna end up with a quantity that is larger than or equal to 10, but that's okay, because if I mark the whole thing by 10, I just get rid of the excess part. So arithmetically speaking, this is what we can do to compute the single digit difference. And then in terms of the borrow, which means if I subtract v from u, and do I need to borrow one from the next digit, but that's an easy one, because as long as u is less than v, yes, we need to borrow. So it doesn't even depend on the base. The only part that specifies the base is this quantity here that we add to u before the subtraction, and also the mod of the 10, which is also the base in this particular uh, specific case. So are we doing okay so far with the derivation of the R function, which is the single digit difference, and the B function, which is whether we need a borrow or not? Are we good? So if you notice that these are, even though the definitions are different, but they seem to be doing the single digit sum and also the carry function of the earlier section that talks about addition, then you are 100% correct, okay? There's a certain parallelism between this and the similar concept that we talked about in addition. All right, so in 
just to make sure that we understand what is the R function and what is the B function, I just wrote these two in C++, okay, so no, no surprises there. So now, instead of explaining all the derivation, I just give you, you know, the entire thing. So if you look at X, Y, Q, T, and D as the rows, these, this is the way we compute all the different digits. The inputs consist of X, Y, and T, zero. So T0 is actually an input, even though most of the time it is just zero, okay? So given those are the inputs, Q can be easily computed because it is the R between the XI and the YI. D is also easily computed because it's the, D, it's the single digit difference between the QI and the TI. T of I plus one is the one that is more difficult. Let me go back to the earlier example to show you why it is a little bit tricky. What triggered this borrow of one, the one that is highlighted? In the digit zero subtraction, which part triggers that borrow of one? Uh, the subtraction on x and y. The subtraction between the x and the y. Because one is less than four, and therefore we need to borrow from the next digit. So when you, the, when you look at the next one, which is here, what triggered that particular borrow of one? between the Q and the T, because when you look at column one, Q is zero, T is a one. So when you perform a single digit subtraction between the zero and the one, the single digit um, difference is nine. We got that. But we also triggered a borrow of one, which means there are two reasons why we might end up with a borrow of one. Between the subtraction of the X, Y, we can, borrow, we can end up with a borrow of one. But between the subtraction of the Q and the T, we can also end up with a borrow of one. So if you're thinking, oh, this sounds really awfully similar to there are two reasons to have a carrier of one in addition, then you would also be 100% correct. Okay, detecting these similarity or pattern is important, okay, because that is the whole idea of programming, okay, because when you're writing a program, you are abstracting. You're basically looking at something that you know how to do by hand and turn that into a description so that the computer or another person can follow. So those are all important points to kind of, you know, that I need to point out. All right, so getting back to the point that, that we are currently at. So when we look at the relationship between all the digits, uh, give me a second here. We are not quite there. There we go. So when we look at all the, the relationship between all the digits, this is the part that I want to get back to. Uh, Q of I can be computed based on X, I, Y, I. D of I can be computed based on Q, I, T, I. And the T of I plus one, which means the T of the next column or the, com the column immediately to the left-hand side, can be computed using X, I, Y, I, Q, I, T, I. But in, instead of using the R function, we have to use the B function because both because we're determining do we have a borrow of zero or do we have a borrow of one? <coughs> Are we still doing okay at this point? Are there any questions? We are we are doing okay? All right. So hmm. So when you look at the pattern, you look like hey, this looks like exactly the same pattern in addition. Q of I is the R of X, I, Y, I. That is correct. Even though the R for addition is defined differently, I chose to use R again here for a reason. So we'll see why that is the case. D, D of I is R of Q, I, T, I. Eh, that's a little bit different because last time we have S of I is R of uh, Q, I, and K, I, okay? But nonetheless, the dependency of which bits of the same column has not really changed. When you look at T of I plus one, eh, the letters have changed. Instead of a K, we have a T. Instead of a C, we have a B. And once again, instead of a T, we had a K. But otherwise, the structure is exactly the same. So those are all important things, okay? Because when you notice similarity, between sections of the discussion here, the amount of material you actually have to memorize is just halved. 
because you notice the difference. It's like, oh, okay, subtraction is kind of like addition with only these minor differences, okay? Because, so that is actually a very important part for you to notice is how things are similar, but they're not exactly the same. So it's also important to notice how are they slightly different. All right, so we're going to move on to base two subtraction now. So the first thing is, instead of just talking about base two right away, we can now generalize. In other words, if I were to use B as a, excuse me, if we are to use E as the base, I cannot use B as the base anymore because B is the name of the function B's. So I'm going to use the field letter E as the base. So all I have to do is to say R of U B is whatever the base is plus U, which is the digit, the minimum digit, minus V, which is the subtrahend. In other words, compared to what we had before, and then a mod, oh, this is supposed to be a mod E, not a mod B. Okay, let me fix that first, okay? Um, you can see how easy it is to fix these things. I open this on a new tab, so it doesn't interfere with the tab that I was already on. And then I just need to get to the section that talks about binary subtraction. So give me a second here. Yeah, this is a module that I wrote recently, so I haven't had a chance to really debug the entire thing yet. And I think it is this B that's supposed to be an E. There we go, commit change, like that. And it's gonna take about 45 to 50 seconds in order to refresh because uh, some major server side stuff is happening on the other side. But for the time being, all we need to do is to say, oh, okay, this is not mod B, this is mod E. But the whole thing is, oh, we just changed the 10 to a D. That's all I did. Is that okay? Does everybody notice what I just did? Okay. Um, but when you look at B, you know, the borrow function, it does not even depend on E or the base whatsoever. So it doesn't need any changes. Is that okay? All right, so just like the time when we worked with binary addition, we just look at all the possibility for the B function. So we say zero minus zero has a borrow of zero. Zero minus one is the only time we have a borrow of one because one minus zero has a borrow of zero and the one minus one also just has a borrow of zero. You look at this and go like, hmm, but that looks, looks kind of weird. Um, it does look like some kind of binary stuff going on, you know, because everything is zero and one, right? But it's not conjunction, it's not disjunction, it's some weird stuff. So instead of, you know, me asking you guys to derive the borrow function, I'm going to give you the borrow function. So the borrow function can be expressed using the negation of u and so if you're not familiar with these symbols, you might need to review the content from the very first week of this class because the symbols of the Boolean operators as mathematical symbols are stated at the beginning of the entire semester. So uh, my suggestion is to put all the definitions of all the symbols in one single place in your notes. So that would be easier for you to kind of look it up and go like, oh, okay, this symbol means this or this is how the equation is defined here, and so on and so forth. Put all the definitions at one place. That would also serve as the material that you might want to bring with you in exam one, because open, it's open book and open notes. What are you gonna bring? I'm not gonna tell you what to bring. I'm not gonna give you what you need to bring. You are the one who is going to come up with the material that you will bring to the exam. Does that mean that I, you cannot just print this out and bring with you? By all means, okay? Everything that is linked from the Canvas shell, you can bring, you can print it out and bring with you. The question is, if you are bringing my notes, can you remember where I put the definitions? Even I cannot remember. <laughs> I have to look around a little bit. So that means you have to be writing your notes, okay? you have to write in your own study guide all along, okay? That is not something that you do right before the exam. You have to be writing your own study guide 
all along. All right, so are we understanding this portion here, the negation of u and v? All right, so we'll double check, does that actually work? Well, let's plug in some values. Look at the first row. Well, since the conjunction has v in it, and v is a zero, we know the result has to be a zero. Okay, that's an easy one. These two are also easy, okay, the, the last two rows, because both of these have u being a one, but we negate the u before the conjunction, so that means the one turns into a zero before the conjunction. Well, as long as, long as one side of the conjunction is a zero, the whole thing is a zero. Easy to explain. This is the only one that has a one, so let's take a closer look. u is a zero to begin with, not zero is a one. u, I mean, v is not negated, so we have one and one, which is a one. Is that okay? Is everybody convinced that, oh, we just ditched um, comparison, and we can rely on only Boolean operators to get this done. Once again, the whole point of converting everything to, your, to just use Boolean operators is we already know how to convert each Boolean operator into transistors. Well, okay, I skipped a step here. We know how to convert each one into NAND gates, and then NAND gate itself can turn into transistors. So indirectly, we already know that this entire thing, oh, easy, we can turn it into transistor. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So now we look at the R function, okay? And this is what the R function you know, turns out to be. All I did, all I did was to plug in 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 into uh, R of UV and used the original, the arithmetic version of the R function here, okay? And that turned out to be the table that I show you here. Now, do you trust me and go like, okay, your text says so. No, don't trust me, okay? You can jot down a little bit of note on the side and say, I need to double check this, okay? Because you know, that is how, it's not so much that you need to do it in this class or in any one of your classes. It is training your mindset of questioning everything Okay, it is, I wouldn't call this critical thinking, but it is the predecessor or the prerequisite to have the critical thinking skill. Why is that important? Why do I bother to mention that word when we are kind of running short on time? Why do I mention critical thinking? Well, let me ask you another question. Do you want to land a job after getting your bachelor's degree in computer science? If you're taking this class only for fun, then I guess critical thinking may not be important in the future. But I'm guessing every single one of you want to get a bachelor's degree in computer science, computer engineering, electrical engineering, or some other related field, and try to get a job. If that is the case, then critical thinking is important. Why is it? Why is that the case? Yep. Yep. But why is critical thinking particularly important now and more so than before? Because we have. Before, a lot of tasks are actually kind of mundane and procedural, um, but we have better tools now. So a lot of the mundane thing that you have to do by hand is like, oh man, I'm gonna do the same thing over and over, over again 20 times. Those things are no longer around. Anything that we can automate are automated. So there are no repetitive tasks left to hire people to do. If you look at even fast food places, which is quote unquote mundane, what do you think the fast food you know, chains are trying to do now? Fry, you know, okay, I need to get some fries you know, done. Okay, get some fries out of the freezer, put it into the frying you know, cage, put that into the oil, make sure the temperature is go on, so you know, a certain temperature, and then after a certain amount of time, you know, I lift it, I mean, they even have time it, okay? So it's sort of, sort of procedural. And what do you think McDonald's is already have been doing research for years? Robotics. Anything that is repetitive, 
it's, going to be, it's not going to be done by a person. What about programming? When you're doing your homework assignment in CISP 360, 400, or 430, it may not seem mundane to you, okay? But let me tell you, basically all the homework assignments that you need to do here, for the most part, kind of depends on who's teaching the class, Chat GPT can do it already. Now, am I telling you guys, oh, you don't have to do your homework anymore, just kind of go to Chat GPT and get the, whole, get the whole thing done? No. It should be scaring you because you know, Chat GPT can, I would say, can reliably do the homework of every single class in the, at the community college in the computer science program, including CISP 310. Well, okay, I, I would say excluding it because for, for strange reason. But 440, even for discrete structures, Chat GPT can actually figure out the answers already. And that's why critical thinking is important because that is the one thing that AI is still not very good at. Okay, you can look it up, okay? This is kind of fun to watch. You can look up um, YouTube videos that where people show how to gaslight AI. <laughs> okay, if, if somebody can gaslight AI, it means AI or whatever the chat engine is, is not very good at critical thinking. It just goes like, oh, if you tell me that I'm wrong, I guess so, let me just work on this again. But that's the future that you guys are looking into, okay? We talked a little bit about AI last Wednesday already, okay? But I want to kind of keep that in your mind all the time, okay? So critical thinking is important. Do it at least once for yourself to make sure that, oh, okay, I know where this table is coming from. But knowing where this table is coming from, you also might notice that, haven't we seen this before? Yes, we have. Because the R function for addition, even though the arithmetic version is different, in base two, they boil down to exactly the same thing. So that's why I kept the same, same name of R of beauty to be the single digit sum or single digit uh, difference in both cases, because they both gave, gave us exactly the same truth table. But when we talked about the binary addition uh, portion, we already said, oh, okay, we can either use exclusive or as a single logical operator, but we can also use the longer form making use of only conjunction, negation, and disjunction to express exactly the same thing. So this part has been covered already when we talked about binary addition. If it is kind of in your mind, if you think, yeah, I, I remember that. In fact, I know exactly where it is because I wrote some notes about it. Great, okay, that's what I want to hear. On the other hand, if somebody were to say, I have no idea what this is, okay, I have no idea, I do not remember seeing the exclusive or operator like this one, nor this your, your spelled out format of exclusive or, I would start to worry, okay, in that case. We're still in week three, okay? So there's, there's still plenty of time for people to catch up, but noticing that people need to start to catch up is important, okay? I don't want people to kick the can down the road and then only to find like, at the end of the road, you have like a few hundreds of cans down there, but go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask, so what we're looking at it right now is this kind of added subtract, and those are in terms of, I mean, I'll see as a state that kind of but mm -hmm. it comes down to like characters. For example, a T right there, and that's the first letter I'm looking at it. So how does the, what is the computation process? Do we get there later? Or it it's the same thing, okay? Because there's really no such thing as characters. Each character is no more than just an integer, right. a, you know, a, a shorter one. So if you know how to compare integers, you know how to compare letters. So essentially what you're saying is that regardless of being a different Type, everything goes boils down to be a, a number, and then boils down to be a. Just about, okay, just about. The only thing that is not using this kind of math, or at least not directly, are the the uh, doubles and the single, the, the floats. Okay. Yeah. But we have, you know, we we got to spend some time on the floats as well, so we'll we'll deal with that later. But right now, you know, chars signed and unsigned, they all work like this. 
All right, so what are we gonna do now? Well, I mean, there's really not much to say, okay? Because you know, the only thing left to do is, oh, we still have this addition here. In other words, the borrow of one can be coming from xi minus yi, but it can also be coming from qi minus ti. This addition symbol here is, was what we started off with. So now the question is, wait, I think we did a little trick in binary addition. That plus the addition was replaced by a disjunction because the C of xi, yi, and the C of qi cannot be true at the same time. And as a result, you know, using a or, logical or, is okay in order to replace the um, arithmetic addition. So if you remember that discussion, great, okay? If you cannot, once again, I'm, a, I'm going to start to worry a little bit, okay? Because things do stack up rather quickly in this class, okay? Not being able to have a solid foundation as we build up more material can be problematic in the future. So in this case, we have to ask the question, can B of xi, yi be a one while B of qi and pi also be a one at the same time? Is that scenario possible? Okay, it's not possible, okay? Just like in the addition case, it's not possible. Why it is not possible is actually explained in the following sentences. So the short answer is no, but the long answer is QI is not, it's because QI is not independent. In other words, QI depends on XI, YI. So when XI, and XI is a one, YI is a, is, excuse me, when XI is a zero, YI is a one, so the B of XI, YI is a one, Q of I has to be a one because Q of I is the exclusive or between XI, YI. But if Q of I is a one already, then P of QI, TI has to be a zero regardless of the value of TI. Because one minus either a one or a zero should not give you a borrow of one. Is that okay? That's hard to see. Huh? That's hard to see. It's hard to see it because of the use of the symbols, right? So, um, the way, there are two ways to visualize this, okay? The first way to visualize is to use the tables. So you ask, when does B of U, V become a one? This is the only time it becomes a one, okay? So that means you know, if this B of U, V is the B of X, I, Y, I, X, I is a zero, Y, I is a one. Is that okay? But then we also know that Q of I is the R of X, I, Y, I. So when you look at the R thing here, that means you know if x if x i is a zero y i is a one then q of i has to be a one. Is that making any sense? But if q of i is a one, that means we are now you know if this column if u is q i and v is t i that means in both cases there there should be a borrow of zero coming out of the b function. All right, so the difficulty or the challenge at this point is all the symbols, okay? How does xi, yi relate to each other? How do we apply the r of xi, yi? What does it mean? Okay, it's q of i. And what about b of xi, yi? What is that representing? Where, you know, which part of the equation depends on it? They are all here. This is basically the entire bottom line is how the bits or how the digits are related. Now, how do I make all those links, right, in your head, okay? Because there are, there are multiple steps involved here. Because what I'm saying is, if B of X, I, Y, I is a one, then what do we know? Well, you have to kind of look into the truth table and find out that if B of X, I, Y, I is a one, that can only happen when X, I is a zero, and y i is a one. Okay, but if that is the case, then you look up this definition here. You go like, oh, okay. If x i is a zero, y i is a one, then q of i has to be a one. And then you plug that back 
into b of q i t i, and you say, uh, if q i is a one, then no matter what t i is, b of q i t i has to be a zero. So that comes to one conclusion, which is, if b of x i y i is a one, it guarantees that b of q i t i has to be a zero. They can, so in, in that one direction, they cannot both be ones. Then you can also go the opposite way and you ask, but what if b of q i t i is a one? Does that also guarantee that b of x i y i cannot be a one? Yes. Okay, so let's try to work that out. Okay, only using this portion of the notes and the truth table, which is spelled out in just a little bit but later on. So let's say b of q i t i is a one. How can that happen? Okay, using the truth table down a little bit, b of q i t i can be a one in base two, only because q i is a zero and d t i is a one. Very good. Okay, so if q i is a zero, what do we know about x i y i? We cannot narrow down to a single case. There are two possible cases to make q of i a zero. So what do we know about x i y i when q of i is a zero? Okay, let's let's go take a look. Okay, because that is correct. Okay, they are the same. So when x i y i are both ones or both zeros, what about the b of x i y i? Got to be a zero. That's right. Okay. So now we worked out the other direction too, which is if b of q i t i is a one, we guarantee that b of x i y i is a zero. In other words, we just guaranteed they cannot both be ones at the same time. Because if if b of q i t i is a one, then b of x i y i has to be a zero. And vice versa, if b of x i y i is a one, then b of q i t i has to be a zero. In other words, I have just made an argument to say that they cannot both be ones. Can they both be zeros? Yeah, they can both be zeros. That happens, but they cannot both be ones. So if they cannot both be ones, then we can use the same argument that we used earlier in base 10 uh, addition, because we use this table. We basically just said that, look at u as q of, I mean, b of x i y i, look at b as b of q i t i. We just said that this row can never happen. But if that row cannot happen with the first three rows, then it really doesn't matter whether we use logical or, or we use arithmetic, arithmetic addition, they still give us the same correct result. Is that okay? So, so, okay, so what kind of uh, math or what kind of concept did we just apply here? It really is just reasoning. It's, it's just reasoning. I, really, I probably should not use the word just, okay, because there's a lot of symbols as well involved in the whole process. So how do we get, how do we get comfortable with the symbols, okay? Because you have to kind of, when you look at Q of I, it's not just Q of I. You have to look at it as, Oh, this is you know, the R of X, I, Y, I, and in base two specifically, it is the exclusive or between X, I, Y, I, and here's the truth table. So how do you get familiarized with all those concepts so that it's easier for you to make the connections you know, across all the symbols? You have to work it out. You just have to kind of work out all the math you know, a few times, look at the definitions, and make sure that you know how to apply that. So in in that sense, you're know, reading a little bit ahead you know, is helpful because you, you will get at least some idea of you know, what symbols we're going to use, what kind of argument we'll be using, and so on. All right. But I, I like your question. You know, that's, those are very, very important questions to ask. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So that means at the in the end, we already 
you know, once we perform, you know, the once we replace the arithmetic addition with a Boolean disjunction, then we are done because now we just go like, oh, okay, t of i plus one is just that. Everything can be done using Boolean operators. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. Well, since we said that if everything can be translated into logical operation, then it can be done in it can be done in a, in a circuit. So why don't we take a look at a circuit that can do this? So fortunately, I worked this out last Thursday with the Tuesday Thursday class already. So we don't have to work everything from the ground up. I only have to explain it in this class. So that saves us a little bit of time. So instead of doing that just now, we're going to take row. So go ahead and sign in to Logisim, look, not Logisim, to Canvas. And today is the 9th. So let me unhide this and show the access code. So the access code is a little funky, okay? I'm gonna write it on the whiteboard. So the access code is X, Y, Q, T, D. Yep. And why do you think I chose that as the access code for today's rotating? Yep, because those are the names of the roles that we talked about today. Yep. Even the access code is a way for me to remind everybody what we have been talking about. All right, so since this is on the whiteboard, I'm going to continue with the notes. And, oh, right. So let me show the circuit first, okay? Because the circuit is actually kind of interesting to look at. And All right, as I said a little bit earlier, the circuit was already done. Um, so what I'm doing today is really just to show you the circuits. So we'll start with this, okay? So you can see that there are certain names here that are resembling what we have been talking about, and but they look kind of funky, okay? So the U and the V are input pins. We know those are input pins because they're in squares instead of circles. The circles are the outputs. One is R of U, V, okay? R, it is the, it can either rec be representing the single digit sum or the single digit difference. But since we know that in base two, they are really the same thing, yeah. Not a problem, okay? Just say R of UV. But this part looks kind of funky because instead of saying it is a B of UV or the C of UV, I use a slash, which means eh, sometimes it is the borrow, sometimes it's the carry. Hmm, that looks kind of confusion, confusing. And then over here, I have another bit called subtraction. So when this bit here, subtraction, is a one, that means we're dealing with subtraction. If it is a zero, it means we're dealing with addition. In other words, I'm trying to use exactly the same circuit to deal with both addition and subtraction. Because the only difference between those two is how do you compute the C, the carry function, as opposed to the borrow function. So let me switch back to the notes a little bit, just so that I can point out you know, why they are so similar and you know, where they are slightly different and I have to deal with just that part of a difference. So we'll take a look at the binary version or the uh, binary version of the B function or the borrow function, which is right here, okay? So take a look at this one here. Um, I'll, I'll do you guys, I'll show you a trick. I think it's a really kind of useful trick. I'm using the screenshot function of my uh, operating system. Windows has something like this too. So the way they operate may be slightly different. And I'm gonna show this on the screen and I'm gonna say always on top. So this one you know, does not go away when I scroll the uh, other screen. So now I wanna go to the carry function. 
for this in base two. So the carry function in base two is uh, was about here. It was one. It, it was the easier one of between the two. So it is here. So we'll go ahead and um, put these side by side. Right here. Okay. First of all, do you notice that they look about the same? The borrow function versus the carry function, they're kind of the same with a minor difference. The only difference is, um, are we just gonna take u you know, for the conjunction, or are we gonna negate u first before we do the conjunction? That's the only difference. Is that okay? We still have to involve a conjunction. Yeah. We still have to involve v, which is not negated in either case. Okay, do we notice that? So that means if I can build a circuit that can you know, negate u only for subtraction, but keep u the same way not negated when I don't want to per when I want to perform addition, then I have one quote unquote universal circuit to do both. Which is always good, okay? Because in computer science, as I have pointed out a few times, we're looking for abstraction. So now the question is. Do you think the output out of this exclusive OR gate, this is exclusive OR, is um, if I want subtraction, this is going to be the negated version of U. If I don't want subtraction, or when subtraction is a zero, this is just V. Now, there are several ways to do this. You can work this out using a truth table, or you can just exercise the circuit here. So you can see that subtraction is a zero, which means I am not performing subtraction. So whatever com is coming out of the exclusive OR gate here, going into the AND gate, should be just U itself. Ah, I see, U is a zero, this is also a zero, because it's dark green. If I were to change U to a one, this also changes to one. Okay, yep. Did you say for, for the subtraction, you're saying that U is zero if you're actually doing the subtraction, and one if you're doing the sum? Is that what you're trying to say? No. One, it is a one when we are trying to do a subtraction, it's a zero when we are trying to do addition. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. let's say, yeah, go ahead. Is slash adding? I don't know. It's just confusing to me if we do a subtraction next. So. Okay. So if we do want to do a subtraction, then this output has to be the opposite of u, which it is already, right? This is light green, which is a one. If I flip the u to a one, the output of the exclusive four becomes dark green, which is a zero. So this is a hands-on way to look at this, but you can also use a truth table approach to look at the entire thing. So let me use uh, the truth table approach, and I need to get the job done. There we go. All right. So let's let's do let's look at the truth table approach to do this. So we got um, u, we got v, and then we have um, no v is not even important here. So we got negative. And then we have um, u exclusive or with negative. And then we have the negation of u. Oh, we have, uh, yeah, negation of u. All right, so now we have um, four rows to deal with in this truth table. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. There are four of these. Okay. So we can have u being zero, we are not subtraction. Okay, got it. This is supposed to be subtraction. My bad, subtraction. All right, so the exclusive or is a zero and then the negation of u is a one in this case. And then we have zero, one, which means we want to perform subtraction. This is a one, this is a one. We have a one, a zero, this is going to be a one, and this one is going to be a zero. And then the last one is when we have one, one, and then we have a zero here, and then we also have a zero here. All right, so you only have to focus on the right-hand side, which is this one here. So the question is, if we are performing subtraction, we should be looking at the second and the fourth row. The question is, are we negating u looking at the exclusive or between subtract, uh, ex, u exclusive or with subtraction. 
So you compare these two, yep, they're opposites to each other. Compare these two, they're also opposites of each other. So it works. If we are not performing subtraction, which means we are performing addition, we do not want to negate uh, do. So now the question is, are they the same? They are indeed the same. So the truth table of exclusive or can now be used to basically go like, oh, so this is a really weird looking mechanism, but it does get the job done, okay? Because when we want to perform subtraction, exclusive or, you know, connected this way, is gonna negate you, but only when we want to perform subtraction. When we want to perform addition, it just leaves you alone and go like, okay, whatever you is, the exclusive or result is also going to be just whatever you is. Is that okay? All right. So that's why this circuit is kind of interesting because it just use, uh, it has UV as the input, but we also can specify, are we performing a subtraction? If we are performing a subtraction, this is a one. If we're, we are performing an addition, that should be a zero. Is that okay? Yeah, that also explains why the output pins look kind of funky, because you know, this is a, it, it is a borrow when it is a subtraction, but it is a carry when it is an addition. So that's a, this is called a HAS, which is a half adder subtractor. So when you know that a circuit is called half something, what, what, is, what, do you, what does your mind anticipate? There has to be a whole or a you know, full you know, version of this, and that's what FAS is. So FAS stands for whole adder subtractor. So in this case, instead of using U and D, I'm using X, I, Y, I, uh, T of I, K of I, because it depends on whether we're subtracting it or adding. And then I change the name of the pin to S slash A, which means if it is a one, we're subtracting. If it is a zero, we're adding. So this is actually a fairly standardized way of labeling pins on a chip, on an actual chip. Whatever is after the slash is quote unquote negated, which means if it is a zero, then it is whatever the right hand side of the slash wants to specify. If it is a one, it is whatever is to the left hand side of the slash that we want to specify. So in this case, it means if it is a one, we are subtracting, otherwise we are adding. So how does this work? So you look at x, i, y, i, and you look at where they go. So they go into the first you know, half add a subtractor as u and v, but if you are having u and v here, then the r output is gonna be q of i. So the first question is, do you understand why this is labeled q i? Why the output of the r of a half add a subtractor is labeled q i? Can you relate that to the equations? And if so, which part of the equation establishes why I named that particular wire q of i? It has to do with q of i is the r of x i y i. So that's why you know, having those definitions in one place is going to be helpful because then you look at all the symbols, okay? Then you can relate those symbols around and go like, oh, okay, so this is really just a circuit way of looking at things. What about this wire here? What about this wire? Okay, let me use the poking tool. What about this wire? That would be equivalent to either B of X, I, Y, I in the, in the case of a subtraction or C of X, I, Y, I in the case of an addition. That is going into an OR gate because there are two reasons why K of I plus one or P of I plus one is a one. Not a single reason, there are two reasons why it can be a one. So that's one of the input to the OR. So let's take a look at, at this OR gate here. You know, where do we see an OR operator? So we go to the, okay, where's my, I just got past it again. It's the third one, there we go, okay. So the OR, the OR gate is corresponding to this OR for addition. It is also corresponding to this OR in the case of a subtraction. 
this B here is OR. That is the OR corresponding to that operator. Do you see the resemblance? Okay. Now, this is the first time you see this diagram, okay? If you don't make the association right away, I guess it's normal, okay? But I'm explaining, you know, what this circuit has to do with all the things that we have talked about so far. So you take Q of I, okay, and you put it into the second pass, okay, the second half add a subtractor. So you ask, okay, once we compute Q of I, how do we use Q of I in the original equations? So you switch back to the equations and you look at this and go like, oh, okay, I can see how Q of I can be used um, to make use of the B function, and that goes into the OR gate, okay? And we have to combine that with K of I in the case of addition. Okay, this is another typo. I should have changed this one to a P of I because this is for subtraction. I'm gonna change that in just a little bit. But right now, I'm just gonna say, okay, so when we look at the circuit, what is it doing? So this Q of I, this is Q of I, this V is T of I or K of I. So when you look at the output here, that is the borrow, okay? That, the Y that I'm highlighting right now is the V of QI, TI, um, or the C of QI, KI in the case of an addition. So those two are ORed to become the actual T of I plus one or K of I plus one. So that's how this particular circuit works. I'll send this file to all of you so that you have some time to really kind of look at this diagram, look at all the definitions in the module, and kind of make the uh, correlation between those two, okay? Because you know, that is also important. Any questions? Yes. The, the Which one? The first one. The first that one? Uh-huh. This is exclusive or. Yep. This is and. Yep. Yeah. The way you can look those up is to look into gates and oh, just yeah. kind of match those symbols. Or click it too. But this is the first time you see it, so I, I understand why. Yeah. There's 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 a question. Yeah. You can click it too. So once I give you the files, it will be easier because you can examine the file. You can click on things. But the idea is to look at these two diagrams and relate the diagram back to the definitions in the reading module. So now that we have a FAS, then we can start to come, you know, actually make the adder. This is a three bit by three bit adder. So X has three bits, Y has three bits. The difference or the sum also has three bits. T, of K, uh, T or K zero is an input. Most of the time it's just zero, but it is nonetheless an input pin. And then we have one more to specify, are we subtracting or are we adding? X is split into the three individual bits. Bit zero goes into um, the first um, FAS, F-A-S. This goes to the second FAS. And then this goes to the last little FAS. Same thing for Y, okay? Your bit zero goes to the first. Bit one goes to the second. Bit two goes to the third one. Because you know, in the first one, okay, this is, this means, okay, this means I equals to zero. This means I equals to one, I equals to two, I equals to zero, I equals one, and I equals to two. But then when you look at the output, this is just D of zero or S of zero. This is just, you know, D of one or S of one, and D of two or S of two go through a, another splitter, but arrange backwards, then we have the actual difference or the sum as a three bit number. But the funny thing is this one here, because that's T of I plus one, but I equals to zero in this case. So that means we're just dealing with T of one or K of one. Where is it supposed to go? It is supposed to go to the input of the second you know, fast or full adder subtractor and the output of this one goes to the third one. So now we can see there's a linear dependency. Until this is done, this thing will give you a result, but it may not be correct, because this entire thing relies on 
this bit, this output of the first full adder subtractor to be correct. Until this one is done completely, this one cannot give you the right result because it also depends on the output here. Okay, let me see if I can just highlight the wire. So that's why this is called a ripple adder or, or subtract. Because you have to wait for the carry or the borrow to ripple from the bit zero to bit one, and then you have to wait for it to uh, ripple from bit one to bit two, and so on. So it takes a long time. You know, the amount of time this circuit needs to complete an addition is proportional to the number of bits of the two numbers that you're trying to add or subtract. Okay, But conceptually, believe it or not, this is the easy one to understand, which means there's one that is much harder to understand, which I used to teach, but not anymore, Okay, because that takes up another week or so to explain the concepts, and I felt that uh, it may not be 100% relevant to what we are doing here. So let me, before I forget, okay, let me send this to the whole class so that you guys have access to that file. <clears throat> and let me do a full announcement. So this is a three by three other subtractor using ripple carry or borrow ripple. See attached and attach that. Yep, that's the right one. Pretty quick. All right, publish. There we go. So now you have a copy of this same file. Okay, so once again, you know, the way you quote unquote study this diagram is to look at the HAS, the have adder subtractor, and the full adder subtractor and see if you can relate those to the general equations that we talk about in this particular module. And then after that, you know, try to figure out how the actual three by three bit adder works. So I can test it too. I mean, let's go ahead and test it a little bit here. So adding zero to zero, okay, we're adding because subtraction is a zero. With T zero being a zero, we get a sum of zero, zero, zero. That seems to make sense. So let's try some other number. So you guys can tell me. First of all, give me a number from 0 to 7, and give me another number from 0 to 7, and then tell me whether you want to add or subtract. So those are the four things that are three things that I need you to tell me. So tell me what is x. Only has to be a number from 0 to 7. Any number could do. 2. 2. OK, very nice. So x is 2. What about y? Six, okay. And do we want to add or subtract? Subtract, okay. Well, we can always kind of work through a few examples, right? Okay, so first of all, let's do it by hand first. <clears throat> X is zero, one, zero. Y is one, one, zero in base two. Does that make sense first, okay? Does zero, one, zero in base two represent the quantity of two? And one one zero represents the quantity of six. Okay, that's good. You guys are all nodding. Okay, very good. So I'm going to use the long format, zero minus zero. Or this is supposed to be just the exclusive OR of these two numbers. So that's a zero. That's a zero. That's a one. The input I'm going to assume you know t zero is a zero. Okay, this is just an assumption. Put a zero here. So that's going to be a zero. Zero minus zero does not have a borrow of one. Zero minus zero does not have a bar of one, so we have a zero here. Zero minus zero is just a zero. One minus one is a zero, does not have a bar of one. Zero minus zero also does not have a bar of one, so I have a zero here. One minus zero is a one. Zero minus one, on the other hand, has a bar of one. Put a one here. Okay, so that means when everything is done, this is my T3, which is corresponding to that output pin, the second, the bottom output pin over here. That should be a 1. And we should also see 1, 0, 0 as the difference. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Next, we, we want to make sense of the output, okay? Because what, what this is saying is 
What quantity, by the way, is 100 zero, zero representing? 100 zero, zero in base 2 is representing 4. That's right. So that means 2 minus 6 is a 4. But we have a borrow. How much are we borrowing? We are borrowing 8 because this is digit 3 in base 2. So we are borrowing 8. 4 minus 8 is negative 4. Eh, I think it works out. So now we exercise the circuit. And we say, OK, this is a 2. This is a 6. And we are performing a subtraction. So you can see how the output is 1, 0, 0, which is what we got here. And then we have a T3, in this case being a 1, which is also what we figure out. Now, does that prove the circuit is working? The answer is no, OK? It means that so far we have not shown that the circuit is not working, because this is only one of the many test cases I can throw at it. How many test cases can I throw at this entire thing? You can look at the number of input pins, OK, or the number of bits for the input. There are three here, three here, one here, and one here. So there's a total of how many bits? Three plus th three plus one plus one, eight. That's right. So that means there, there are 256 possible test cases. If I really, really want to test the entire circuit is working for all possible input cases, there are 256 options. Now, if, if it works out for all 256 of the test cases, then it doesn't really matter how it is designed. For all we know, it can be magical. There are pixies and you know, other magical creatures in the chip. But as long as all the test, input test cases work out, we go like, OK, it's working out. Are we good so far? So that's something you can do, OK? Because some people learn better when they have something to concrete to play with. OK, they go like, OK, this is a circuit. I can exercise the input of the circuit, and I can observe the output of the circuit. And they, if they can learn better by doing hands-on exp hands experiment, other people learn better by reading the material that we Okay, I keep skipping the page that I wanted to stop at. So some people do better by just reading, and some people do it by a combination between the two. So how you learn best, okay, only you know. But what I can say is reading material like this is difficult because of the use of symbols. But in programming, when people describe an API, what is an API? Mm -hmm. really application. Application. Yeah, application, application program interface. Okay, API. So when an API is being described, guess what? It is abstract because they're saying this parameter is representing blah blah blah. This parameter is representing blah blah blah. So they're using symbols too. Our symbols is a little bit difficult because it also involves a bit position. Okay, because this that's what the I is representing is the bit position. So it's a little bit more involved, but you know that's kind of the stuff that we have to dig through in order to in order to talk about additional concepts that we have to talk about. So this is just introducing the vocabulary that we need in order to get into signed versus unsigned representation and also comparison. Because without this basis, we, we, I cannot talk about um, signed versus unsigned representation or you know, um, the result of a comparison. All right, are there any questions? Okay, so let me show you one thing that you know, some of you may find it useful and I think most people do not find it useful because as my own son told me, you know, dad, you do not think like most people. I don't think he meant it as a compliment either. So I do want to show you something, an example of how to understand something. Because this is me trying to learn something that is entirely new to me with a lot of symbols that I did not know. Okay? 
And you guys go like, but Jack, you have a PhD in computer science. How can you not understand you know, quantum computing? Because that was not even a thing when I was in computer science. So I never really learned the math you know, involved in your know, quantum computing. So you don't have to read the whole thing. I know the whole thing is going to be quite a chore to read. Even if I were to read this whole thing again, even though I wrote it, it's going to take me some time. So there are some symbols that I have never seen before. Okay, because the first thing of the paper that I was reading, the first thing they introduced is like, look, like that. It's like, I don't know what those mean. I mean, those are all new symbols to me. So what do I do? I don't make an assumption of, I kind of know what it is, or sort of know what it is. I have to dig into it. So I dug into it to find out what that means. This is why the, the, the boxes on the right hand side is the process that I took in order to get this part done. So when you're reading this whole thing, don't try to read this portion because that part is specific to quantum mechanics and also quantum computing. So unless that is also what you want to learn, don't read that part, okay? Only read the stuff in a box because that is a general description of what I went through, the process in my mind, in order to learn something that is very different from things that I'm already familiar with. So this is a process, this is an exercise for myself to learn something that's entirely new, entirely new so I can document it, I can share with other people of how I learned something that is entirely new to me. Okay. Now, is, it, is that going to be helpful to you? I do not know, okay? I don't know whether your mind works similarly to the way that mine works, but I can tell you that you know, this, is, this is what I, this is the way I work, okay? This is how I work. So the, the boxes to the right-hand side is the only portion that might be helpful to you. Ignore the ones, you know, the, the rest of the document because that's specific to quantum computing. I want to point this out here you know, because you know, um, because you, know, you you asked a question, right? You know, so I, I understand the symbols are difficult to get to, so I'm trying to see you know, what way I can illustrate so that it becomes easier. You know, show you guys a process of how to get familiarized with the with the concepts. I think for the most part, the way my mind works is if I don't understand something, if it is kind of like vaguely, I kind of know what it is, I don't move forward. I try to look up and find out exactly what does that symbol mean? In what context? I want you know, to kind of read the entire thing. So by doing that all the time, you know, I'm basically practicing because the next time I see a symbol, I go like, I cannot remember what this means again. Then I go back and retrace all the steps. And that is how I get familiarized with the symbols because I just have to use it uh, Use it, look it up, and reread about it whenever I need it, whenever I need to. So does that, do you think that might be helpful or this is like totally not related to what you want to do? All right, so my office hour is right after class as well. So if you need to ask me questions regarding the reading material, um, you're coming to my office hour is definitely one way to kind of not so much to get some help, but to so that I can see how your process works, and then I can I might be able to give you some suggestions. All right. Are we do we have, do we have any questions? If there are no questions, I'm just going to finish up this entire module. This is a very short paragraph, I know it doesn't look very short, that basically tells you, let me go back to the circuit here, no one in industry actually implements adder and subtractors like that because this is very inefficient. There's a much faster way to get things done, but, the, but there's also a much higher complexity to that approach too. So I'm cutting out that portion. I used to teach that portion as a part of this class, but I want to save some time to talk about to, to talk more about programming, so I'm cutting that part out. What I want to emphasize is this is the worst way, one of the worst way to implement an adder or subtractor. Okay, it is slow, it is inefficient, it's just easy to understand. 
So I'm not going to get into this. And you know, starting now, I'm including a lot of the uh, questions and answers that ChatGPT you know, generates. Uh, the answers coming from ChatGPT was actually wrong, so I have to fix all the actual answers. So they're all correct now. Okay, so if you look into this, uh, let's just pick one. Okay, we'll just pick this one here. <clears throat> We're adding two numbers in base two. 1001, zero, zero, one, which is a 9, 011, one, one, which is a 7. Okay, so we want to know what is the result of this addition. The Q row is the exclusive or between the x, y. 1 and 1 has a 0, 0 and 1 has a 1, 0, 1 has a 1, 1, 0 has a 1. Does everybody know what I just said? I applied the exclusive or operator. Okay, one exclusive or one is a zero. Zero exclusive zero is a zero. But if the two bits are different, then the result of the exclusive or is a one. Then I have to figure out what this bit is supposed to be. So this is for addition. One, one and one is a one. Zero and zero is a zero. One or zero is a one. That's how this one is computed using Boolean operators. Okay, so the entire thing can be calculated either using the original Q and the original C functions, making use of arithmetic operations like addition, log, division, and so on, but it can also be done using the Boolean definitions of the same R, C, and also T, uh, K of I plus one. So you can use either way, okay? But the bottom line is, this is one example of you know an addition in base two. So I'm not going to show you all of the other ones. The whole idea of using um, the HTML details and summary uh, elements is you can see the question, but until you click it, you won't see the answer. So this gives you a chance to work out everything first, and then you click on the answer and compare your answer to what is programmed. So that's a, that's a way for you to exercise. Now, does it count to your grade? The answer is no, because you know you are you can spend as much time as you want. You can work with someone else. You can go to Chat GPT. One thing you can do is to upload the earlier portion of this entire module to Chat GPT, and then interact with Chat GPT, so that you can kind of interact. Like, I'm not really sure what this equation means or how we derive this, and so on, and see if Chat GPT can give you the explanation, but coming from the material that is that I wrote. <clears throat> so we'll pick one example in a subtraction. I'll, do, I'll just go ahead and pick this one. We have 1101 one, one, zero, one minus 1010. One, so Q, once again, is the exclusive or between the X and the Y. So 10 has a 1, zero, 01 has a 1, 10 has a 1, 11 one, one has a 0. But this time it is a subtraction which means we are negating x and y. Zero and zero is a zero. We negate the q and the zero here. We also have zero, zero and zero. Zero or zero is a zero. That's why we end up with a zero here. And then here for this guy, we have zero, negate the zero and the one. Not zero is a one, one and one is a one. It doesn't even matter what this one is going to give me because now we have one, four, whatever, which has to be a one. Okay, so once again, you can either use the arithmetic or the Boolean version of the R or the B function in this case to compute every single bit here and then make sure that your result is right. Now, how do I cross check and make sure that I did not make a mistake? Because ChatGPT gave me the wrong answer, I had to fix it. So I look at this, this is 13, this is 10. 13 minus 10 is supposed to be three, that is indeed three, with an overall borrow of zero. So only using just the base conversion, I can kind of do a sanity check to make sure that the result is not wrong, so here and here. I believe all the bits are checked already as well. Okay, so this is one way for you to do some exercise. You can always kind of work with another person too, just kind of have a buddy, and you go like, okay, come up with a uh, come up come up with a number between zero and fifteen because it's four bits, and then you know somebody else is going to come up with another number, 
Then we're going to, okay, are we adding or subtracting? Uh, let's try subtracting. Then go ahead and perform the, the operation. Because you can always use um, phase conversion to go back and check the result. So there are multiple ways to check whether the result is right or not. If you run out of ways to check the result, they go like, we are still not really sure whether we got this done correctly, then come to my office hour. You don't even have to wait until that point to come to my office hour, okay? So office hours are important. The Mesa Center is also important. How many people are members of Mesa? Okay, we have a few. Have you found it useful? Okay, um, I can tell you that um, my classes, both this class and 440, many tutors or some tutors have taken that both classes already. So it can be very helpful to be able to go through the Mesa tutoring. Mesa tutoring downstairs, first floor. All right, so it's uh, 11.50. So we are pretty much done with this entire module. So that means on Wednesday, we're gonna move on. On Wednesday, we are moving on to the next available module, and all I, just, you know, all I do is just kind of move down. So that means on Wednesday, we are gonna talk about, okay, I lost a little bit here. It is a signed versus unsigned representation right here. So this is what we are going to talk about on Wednesday, signed versus unsigned integer representation. There are AI generated questions and answers as well to that particular module. So when you're done reading, you can go ahead and try out some of those questions. Okay. So right now we are going to, I'm going to open up the uh, lab for today. So the lab for today is Binary addition and subtraction is this one here. <clears throat> I'm going to show you the uh, access code. This one is a little different because I'm using a slightly different tool to come up with um, the lab activity. So the way I get to the access code is a little different. Oh, that's that's right because I tested it myself. So that is correct. Um, here we go. So the access code is related to the access code to the to the vote taking activity, except it's for at addition. So it's Q X Y Q K S. This is not useful anymore, so I'm going to cross it out. So that's the access code of the lab. You should be able to get in now. Yes. So it is X, Y, Q, K, S. Okay. All right. I believe that's that. I'll be back in a few minutes. Can you guys get into the lab? Okay. Okay.